I'm actually going to use this table. I know. See, everybody, the people that are close to me are betting against me. Like, like I'm telling you, people are like, you're going to get up, you're going to walk around, you're going to kick, you're going to stomp, you're going to scream. I'm like, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, like, I, I really feel like, I really feel like, I love this church, man. People just yell stuff. <laughs> I love you, Corey. <laughs> um, I, I, uh, I really believe, I'll just say this. I believe this is possible for everybody, but I believe that there are times where God raises men and women up to be a sign and a wonder to his people. Sometimes, sometimes a prophet's greatest message is the life they live and the stuff that they walk through. It's not always the, the words that they speak. Sometimes it's the things that they encounter. And, and you watch them, and you kind of get an idea about what it is that God is up to and what he's doing among his people. Um, I have no problem using my life or having my life be broadcasted before you, strengths and my weaknesses. So I'm actually going to talk to you about my weaknesses today. And uh, I'm actually going to be really vulnerable, and I'm actually going to confess some things that I feel like God wants me to confess, and uh, in hopes that the Spirit of God moves powerfully today and draws you into what I believe that God is up to and he's, he's, do, he's doing. Is that okay? So um, it's, it's, don't get freaked out. I'm not caught up in some really whack stuff. Like, don't, that's not what I'm saying. But um, how many of you guys watch the, uh, that video of Adam and I up on the stage on Facebook yesterday? Any of you guys see that? It was so funny. Jareb, who's our, our tech leader, said to me, he's, his son Caden said, he watched a video and saw Pastor Brian and, and Pastor Adam dancing on one leg with each other. <laughs> so it was actually a competition we did for this, this man thing yesterday. And, and we had a blast, man. It was fun. It was awesome. And um, I, lost, I lost manliest beard to Eric Verno, but I understand. I get it. <laughs> Eric Verna, see, he's got his hand in the... Devin's like, it's on display. Devin's like, yes, this is my man's beard. Yeah, as long as, long as Nate Pierce wasn't there. But uh, this year's man was called Revenge of the Ground Beef. I think next year we're going to call it Revenge of Brian's Beard. So it's coming next year. But um, yeah, so it was fun. I beat Adam. That was cool. Uh, on that one-legged thing. And uh, my leg is so sore today. My leg, my, my butt area is so sore today from doing that game. But... Um, all right, are you guys ready? I'm excited. I'm excited to just be honest with you. I'm excited to let my life just be an example for you guys today. And, and I'm actually, for the most part, and I usually don't do this, like, I, I'm actually going to read the majority of what I want to say. And the reason why is because there's stuff in there that I just don't want to miss, okay? Um, Matt Graham came up to me today. He saw this slide. He goes, you're using PowerPoint. And he's like, but then I just saw it was one verse after the slide. So I'm not using PowerPoint. But the irony of that is the people that are in my prophetic school they know that's all I do is teach from my PowerPoint, but I'm also known for going off tangents there as well. But um, there's, a, there's a verse that Adam asked me to focus on uh, this morning, and, uh, and I'm a good friend, and I'm a good uh, employee. Um, so you think that would get strange, you know what I mean, working for your best friend, but um, it's really not that bad. It's actually really cool. But um, I'm going to ask you guys, if you have your Bibles, your phones, I want you to turn to First Peter 1. Uh, this is going to tie in very well with what I want to talk to you guys about this morning. And, and I just want to say thanks to Cindy. Um, I've heard those stories before with the Village of Hope. And Cindy, you don't know this, but in the times that I've actually gone and, and traveled and had opportunities to minister elsewhere other than here, I've used those stories at times and have said things like this to people, that if God, if God can take a child that murders his or her parents and cause them to smile again. There is nothing God can't do in your life, I'm telling you. There is nothing God can't overcome in your life. If God can take a child that murders his or her parents and can cause them to smile again. I remember Cindy talking about that the last time that she was here. That these kids just lose, it's almost like their emotions gone. For them to be able to smile again after something like that, God has to be real. Psychology can't do that. Medication can't do that. Only God can do that, right? So 1 Peter chapter 1. I asked Heather to play for me because I think there's something beautiful that opens up um, prophetically when you've got music going on. and um, So I, I enjoy when she does that. I'm actually going to start in verse 3. Jen's going to have 
I think, beginning in, in verse 6 up here. Jen, I realize I always score you when I speak. You know that? I always get you back there at the booth. Not that there's anything wrong. With that, that could be taken wrong. I'm just saying, like, she and I, we, we flow good together. Stay with me. Come on, Holy Spirit. All right, so look at, look at 1 Peter 1. I want you guys to start with me in verse 3, and I want you guys to understand this. See, here's the deal. We had Pastor Don here last yesterday. He was speaking to the men. And I, I wanted, want you to know, I want to qualify this because sometimes in an effort to make sense of our life and sometimes in an effort to feel comfortable, we think everything that happens in life is God's will. And that's not true. God desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of repentance, but not everybody's changing their mind. Over and over and over again, we understand and we believe if we can see it through the life of Jesus, the will of God is not always being manifested on the earth. But if you're not careful, you take every negative thing that comes your way and you say, God's doing this to me. God's not doing that to you. Not if every good and perfect thing comes from him. Not if he's the giver of life and life more abundantly. But if we're not careful, we'll miss opportunities for God to be strong in our lives. We'll miss opportunities that when life squeezes, we'll miss opportunities for Jesus to actually come out. We'll miss opportunities to actually be a witness. Because, guys, I'm telling you, sometimes the greatest, the, the greatest way to be, the greatest way to witness, I love signs and wonders, but sometimes it's watching a persevering Christian. Sometimes it's watching a Christian that's not falling apart and throwing in the towel and actually lives what they say they believe. Perseverance is the greatest sign of faith. I believe that with all of my heart. That's why Jesus says, even to the, in the, the book of Revelations, as John is writing to these, these, these angels of these churches, to they who overcome. Not to those that bellyache, not to those that complain, not to those who shrink back, not to those who whine and grumble, but to those who overcome, I will give. And the list goes on. The crown of life, eternal life. Right, all these different things. But if we're not careful, we're going to miss why things like 1 Peter 1 exist. And I'll, I'll qualify before I read this, this, this portion of Scripture. I will tell you this, that the reason why I believe that trials are called trials, and some of you have heard me say this before, is because in the midst of the trial that you're walking through, God is on trial. I'll say it again. The reason why they're called trials is because in the midst of the trial, it's God who's on trial. He gets brought into question. Well, if he really loved me, then why? If he's so good, then where? And all these things that you've grown up hearing your whole life in an instant get questioned because of what you're walking through in life. And we're missing, we're missing opportunities to really let our light shine. And so let me just read this to you. 1 Peter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to whose great mercy, his great mercy, has caused you and I to be born again to a living hope, to a hope that you and I had no knowledge of until you and I said yes to this good news through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to do what? To obtain an inheritance which is imperishable. It means it's not going to undergo decay, guys. It's not going to go away. And undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. So there's something right now that's waiting for you that, that Jesus paid the price for. That if you and I were able to set our mind on that, it would make sometimes what we walk through so insignificant and small. Paul said it like this. He said, momentary light affliction is producing in me the eternal weight of glory. And guys, he was pressed from every side. He didn't miss the green light. He, he, he didn't, it wasn't that somebody forgot to say hi to him or didn't call him back or didn't hit like on his Facebook post. He was beaten, shipwrecked, in many nights, without sleep, fastings, stoned, momentary, meaning in a moment, light, meaning it's not that big of a deal, affliction, that the things you walk through, if we can change the way we see, if we can see that what we walk through is producing something, if we can change 
how we look at something and see the outcome. It'll make what we're walking through much less significant. Is this making sense to you guys? Okay, now hang on. Now watch this. Who are protected by whose power? God's. Through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Here's where Pastor Adam wanted me to jump in. In this, you greatly rejoice. In what? In what Peter just said. The fact that you have something waiting for you that's not of this world. That one day you are going to spend for all eternity, try to wrap your head around that. You're going to spend all of eternity getting to know the God who's already inviting you to know him now. Because John 17, 3 says, this is eternal life. That you know God the Father and Jesus Christ whom he sent. I believe for all of eternity, we will undergo the pleasure of discovering how great our Father is and how much he loves us. A lot of times we've got our focus on all the wrong things. We have a time perspective and not an eternal perspective. Even though now for a how long? How long are you going to be distressed? A little while. Well, brother, it doesn't feel like a little while. But if you can understand that you're here one day, if you can understand that your life is like a blade of grass, like a flower. Guys, what's up, kiddo? I'm, I'm 37. My oldest is eight. What happened? It's cruising really quick. And can I tell you, the busier life gets, the faster it moves. You know what you and I really need to learn how to do? Slow down and be okay with slowing down. We're missing, guys, we're missing moments. We're missing, life is passing you and I by, and we're missing it. And we're filling our life with needless stuff in an effort to avoid things. Social media has actually caused us to be antisocial. Interesting. Even if for a little while, if necessary, you've been distressed by various trials. Why? So that the proof of your faith, do you know that you only find out what you believe when you walk through life? That's when you find out what you believe. You can sing a great game. Oh. Jesus, I love you. I love you. Oh my gosh, why is this happening to me? You can sing a good game. You can talk a good game. But it's only when the fire gets turned up that you find out what you really believe. And if you spend your whole life avoiding the fire, you'll never find out. If you run from the fire, you'll never grow. If you run from the stretching, you'll never grow. Now, I'm, I've, I've lifted weights for a very long time, a lot of years. You guys have heard me use the example you grow, your muscles grow from resistance. You've got to go through resistance. My, my mother-in-law is over here. She used to be a field hockey coach. She used to coach Nicole's team. And from what I heard, she was a little bit harder on Nicole than she was the other teammates. She had to push the team. You have to push the running the conditioning, the strength training. You've got to go through that to become a great field hockey player. You'll never become an effective witness if you're looking for the glass seas and the calm skies, ever. You'll miss it. You'll miss the opportunity to be Christ in the storm. Your light will never shine if, you're, if, if you never walk through darkness. So that your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. So your joy is the byproduct of what you believe, even though you don't see. Because sometimes when you walk through the darkness, 
It does not feel like, we love, guys, we love the goosebumps. We love the high praise song. And sometimes when it's in the valley, he doesn't always feel really close. But you've got to know that he's close. He's not going anywhere. He's the breath in your lungs. The Holy Spirit is all around. He's in you. He's in all and fills all, the Bible says. It's in that time that you find out whether or not you really believe that. Or you get your eyes off of him and that you get stuck staring, staring at what you're walking through and that will have a voice and try to take peace and joy away. It goes back to a message that I gave here a while back called the eyes of your heart. If you and I don't learn to see with the eyes of our heart and all we do is look with these peepers, we are set up to fall and fail. Your inward reality has to trump your outward reality. Your inward expression has to be able to dominate what's happening around you. It only comes from a relationship with God. It comes from the heart that says, I need to know you. I want to walk intimately with you, Father. And I want to meditate on the fact that this is a Father and a God and the Holy Spirit who says, he'll never leave me or forsake me. See, that truth has to trump your experience. That truth has to dominate what you and I walk through. Obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. So you and I are actually learning to think like heaven when we encounter various trials. Do you know that transformation only comes by the renewing of your mind? You and I have an opportunity through the things that we walk through to change our minds about what we see and what we believe. But what you and I walk through brings into question this good news. It's designed Life is designed to lie. Life is designed to throw you off course. Life is designed, but we can actually, we can actually turn that around for our good. We could also say life is designed to bring out the best in me. Life is designed to bring out the Christ in me. Life is designed to bring out the Christ in me, the hope of glory. Otherwise, we're just taking it as it comes and we're surviving and not thriving when the Bible says you and I are to overcome. So, you're going to hear a lot from Pastor Adam on that. That's my slide. Now I want to share with you, in the short amount of time that I have left, James 5.16 says this, and please forgive me, I, you're not supposed to really jump in at a therefore without knowing what it's there for, okay? That word therefore means in light of what I've just said, or because of this, but I'm going to break my own rule and just jump in there. It says, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you might be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. So that's where we're going to jump in. I'll start by saying this. These past 18 months to two years has been the most difficult time of my life. And that's not an exaggeration or an overstatement. For those that are close to me, they know. In 2014, I woke up to the audible sound of a doorknob being pulled open. Some of you know, have heard me talk about this and felt like that was God saying that that was to be the year of an open door. And I'm not going to go into all of that, but some other people had spoken on similar things and there isn't a door in my house where M M Nicole and I are sleeping. Our bedroom door's not closed. The girls' bedroom doors aren't closed. The bathroom doors aren't closed. So it was something that I heard. It didn't happen naturally, but I heard it audibly. It was something that God was doing to get my attention. At the start of 2015, I was aw awakened to the sounds of, of two gunshots going off. Bang, bang. And I remember coming up out of sleep, and I remember looking over, waiting for Nicole to jump up and be just as freaked out as I was, but she didn't move because just like in 2014, it wasn't that there were actual two, two gunshots going off. It was something that I heard, something that I felt like God was trying to communicate to my spirit. And it was shortly thereafter that I heard these words from God himself, and you can do with this what you want. You don't have to agree with me. That's fine. I asked God, I said, what is this all about? And he said, just very point blank and simple, it's trying to kill you. I don't think it was trying to kill me physically. I think these last two years have really tried to take me out of the game. 
And I have some similar people and close friends, and some of you guys know the, the Billmans, Nick and Rachel, they'll be here with us in July. It's almost there's some people that, that I'm close with that have literally the same time frame. And I hope I can say this, and forgive me if you have children here, but sometimes, it, well, it has felt like all hell has tried to break loose against me and my family. If I get emotional, you know me. Hey, that's what happens sometimes, so I'm not going to apologize for it. But can I tell you something? I'm still here. I'm still smiling. I'm going to kick his teeth in. During these last, and this is, this is just me just kind of giving you some context. This is not me saying, wow, hand this guy a Kleenex. This is not me having a pity party. In these last 18 months to two years, Nicole's biological father had passed away suddenly. My brother Kevin, who's here today, has come to live with Nicole and I. And, and I want you to know, buddy, I would do it all over again, 10 times over. It wasn't that I said to my brother, hey, come live with me. It'll be good for you. It was actually a rescue operation. If I didn't get him out of where he was, I don't know where he would have been five years from now, ten years from now. And I'm going to tell you, it hasn't been easy. I, I, it, was, it was almost as if we were starting in the red and I had to teach him everything you and I took for granted because he wasn't set up well. It had nothing to do with him. It wasn't his fault. And it's been an adjustment. I'm the father of four girls, and I'm also, in a sense, raising a young man. Teaching him how to drive. Teaching him how to get a job. Teaching him how to make good choices, balance a checkbook. Teach him how to think about where do I want to be five years from now. While also parenting an eight-year-old and a four-year-old and identical twin girls. And when you pull somebody out of dysfunction, dysfunction doesn't like that. My mom was very angry with me and very embittered with me. She didn't talk to me. She felt as though I, I, I it was, it was, but I, I kicked the hornet's nest, if I could just say that. During the time Kevin come, has come to live with us, a lot of family issues on my side were stirred up and became very difficult to walk through. People became angry and embittered against one another. I saw stuff come to the surface. I, 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 I'll tell you, I mean, Adam knows, Grace knows, I mean, some of the ones that are close to me, I mean, it's been, it's been wild. I've had to face a lot of relational difficulty, and I have felt the fear of rejection in very intense ways these past two or so years, and I thought I beat it. And I'm like, where's this coming from? My children, a lot of you guys know this, battled multiple bouts of sickness during this time where it seemed as though at least one of them would be sick every other week especially in the times when I would be away ministering somewhere and many of you from the church came out to pray over my house and against the things that were coming against my family. Later on, Nicole's stepfather passed away. It's two fathers in a very short time. My basement flooded for the second time. Many things had to be replaced, not to mention the loss of time of not being able to use the basement within a house that is already packed with people. All on one floor. Most recently, I found out my grandmother's dying, who in many ways was probably more of a mother than my own mom. And the text that I got this morning during worship practice, right before I get up here, is it won't be long now. Sadly, her death has the potential to create even more fighting and bitterness within that side of the family. Add on to all this the pressure and responsibilities of pastoring, leading ministries, traveling and parenting, people who want your help and bring their burdens to you. Fix me, Brian. And the decisions that need to be made as a leader, as a father, and as a husband. You don't get to clock out from that stuff. I started qu quoting James 5.16 in the beginning because I have a sin that I want to confess before all of you. It's not that I'm caught up in lying or immorality or stealing. It's not that I, it, it's, it's, it's this one thing. I haven't been managing my stress and anxiety well. 
Romans 14.23 says that whatever is not from faith is sin. It's a strong statement. And God opened my eyes to the fact that I haven't been handling my stress or anxiety from a place of faith. I've been turning to other things to deal with it and medicate it. On Monday of this past week, God showed me that I've been avoiding the things that scare me and bring me stress. I haven't been dealing with the thoughts or feelings associated with these things. And I've been doing this by not living in the moment. He showed me that my thoughts often drift towards something I'm looking forward to in the near future by way of escaping the pain of today. I found that I often look forward to the day ending when I can sit down and turn on the television as a means of escape. It was in this moment on Monday morning when I realized that most of my life I've played the role of an escape artist. As I look back on my life at all the addictions that I at one time struggled with, drugs, food, pornography, approval, video games, the list goes on, I realize that they were all means of escaping pain and not facing it. They were means of coping, but were never the answer. And although I'm no longer addicted to the things I once struggled with, I can become addicted to avoiding pain by living in tomorrow. If I'm honest with myself, whatever I turn to, and in order to unwind or relieve stress even if it's something as small as daydreaming about an activity or an event I'm looking forward to, I'm ultimately saying that I trust that thing or that person or that event to bring me peace and joy more than God himself. When I do this, I'm not setting my mind on things above where Christ is found, as Colossians 3 encourages us to do, but on the things of the earth as a means to cope. Whatever you and I don't face will continue to grow. Avoidance doesn't diminish stress or cause fear to disappear. Rather, avoidance feeds the problem and actually causes it to get bigger. Avoidance has caused me to lose days and moments all because I was escaping the present. Avoidance isn't courage. It's not faith. It's cowardice. How can we ever receive this day, our daily bread, if we're constantly waiting for this day to be over? If we seek to drown out the fear, stress, or pain through any other means than giving it wholeheartedly to God, we'll miss what He wants us to give us. He will miss what He wants to give us today as the answer. It's not faith to find peace, contentment, and joy in other things other than the Lord. Therefore, it's sin. We don't want to call it that, but that's exactly what it is. The irony of this whole thing is that I felt like God brought me back to the first verses I ever memorized and learned after I was born again. I'm going to read them to you. Those of you that were in my school know what these verses are. They're in Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verse 6. And I'll tell you, these were good verses to memorize. I know them, but I'm going to read them to you. Paul writes, Be anxious, for nothing. Be anxious for no thing. Nothing. No thing. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Don't avoid it. Don't run. Don't lie to yourself and say everything's okay. And the peace of God, 
which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. There was a day in my life where I actually lived that. Where whatever concerned me, I brought it to God and thanked him that he knew the need, answered it, and I left it and I moved on. I actually lived at that realm of faith one day for years. I don't know what's happened. But somewhere I got off the course of that. As the anxiety has built and as the stress has pressed more, I found that I wasn't, I f- maybe I felt like it was weakness on my part. I don't know. But if you have a need, if something concerns you, you bring it and you thank him that he's listening. That's what it means with thanksgiving. You bring your request, God, you know, and I thank you that you care. I thank you that you have provision, you have the answer. I thank you that you love me and you move on and you let the peace of God, not the peace that comes from watching television or belly aching or complaining to a friend, running to the phone, not the throne. You guys know that saying? Looking for sympathy and pity and I wish somebody would understand me. God understands you. And I don't want friends in my life that pity. I want friends in my life that spur and encourage and say, you come on, Brian, you know who God is. But I think sometimes we're very concerned about, well, if people really knew this, then what would they actually think? I don't like living that way. I like integrity. I like character. I like vulnerability. I like honesty. And I know for some of you, this isn't your stuff. I'm just telling you mine. I'm willing to let my life be an example, to be a letter written on your behalf to encourage, strengthen you, and say, come on, we can do this. You're not alone. In the natural, I'll tell you what, there's some stuff right now that Nicole and I are walking through. (laughs) In the natural, right now. In the natural, Nicole and I have every reason right now to be completely freaked out. But God says, I have no reason. I'll never know the peace of God that surpasses all understanding if I don't take what burdens me to him. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Not onto the television, not onto the glass of wine or bottle of beer, not onto drugs, not on the social media, not onto overeating, not onto video games, not onto the things you're looking forward to, not onto hunting, not onto fishing or the various hobbies. All those things can be a means by which we escape what God wants to heal. All of these things can be a vice of some kind. The crutch you lean on. People are even avoiding the stress of raising their own children by withdrawing into social media and all of the gadgets we hide behind. And we're teaching our children to do the same thing. When people are avoiding the stress of responsibility by putting it off or by ignoring it. When we run away or avoid, God never has the opportunity to be for us what we are trying to find in what we turn to. All the while we'll say we believe in him, trust in him, even sing to him, but so many are turning to other means of comfort. We need to learn how to engage the moment with the God who is ever present, not avoid it. I want to see and know the God of today, not tomorrow. I can't be afraid or stressed out because this is what I began to experience this week. I began to experience being in the moment and guys, I would stop doing what I was doing and listen to birds sing and I am not joking. And I would be aware of the colors around me. I'd be aware of my environment and I would engage what was happening around me and I was aware that God was there. He's in the song of the birds. 
I can't be afraid or stressed out if I live in the moment with the God who's already there. His name is I am, not I will be or I was. Matthew 6.34 says, Do not worry about tomorrow. Wow, Jen, you're really fast. It's never a good idea to live outside of the moment. Because tomorrow is filled with one question. What if? That's all that lives in tomorrow. What if this happens? What if that happens? What if it doesn't? And a lot of the stuff that we say what if about, we actually have no real genuine evidence that it's actually going to happen. But we live as if it will. And our mind is there and we miss conversation. We miss relationship. We miss the moment. We miss daily bread. When we live there, our mind goes crazy with scenarios that we don't even know for sure will happen. Matthew 6.34 also says, For tomorrow will care for itself. Tomorrow's coming whether or not you and I fret about it or not. Tomorrow is a bridge we cross when it comes, not something we fall apart over. It ends with each day has enough trouble of its own. Life is better taken one day at a time. It's better to take one moment at a time and be conscious of the ever-present God. Face each day with God in mind. Everything you and I walk through in life is an opportunity for God to be strong in us and for him to be for us what he hasn't had the opportunity to be before. But if I run or seek to escape, he can't be what he wants to be for me. And more often than not, the things you and I turn to create more problems. We spend money and wind up in debt. We get sucked into technology and miss opportunities to make memories with family and friends. The casual drink becomes an addiction. The favorite food causes weight problems. We miss today because we live in tomorrow. In 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 6, David's own people is coming against him. I'm going to write a book on this guy, I'm telling you. David's own people are coming against him. They want to stone him. That's a bad day. Not the stuff you and I walk through. And it says this, that David strengthened himself in the Lord. I'm not going to go into that a whole lot, but I will say this, that we strengthen ourselves when you and I remind ourselves of who God is. You can't let life tell you who God is. You got to know him for yourself. Then life won't be a bully. And anxiety and stress will never take away what you build with him. In Psalm 23, I thought this was neat. I'll cherish this memory forever. When I found out that my grandmother was getting really bad, and Kevin and I went to visit her along with my other two brothers, and she has a renal five kidney, well, kidney failure, level five. She's not eating. She can barely drink. She throws up whatever enters in her stomach. And she motioned for me to come to her and she took my hand and she quoted all of Psalm 23 to me. And can I tell you, that's not a funeral psalm. That's something David was walking through. But he never once says that he felt sorry for himself. It doesn't say that he sat down in the valley. It doesn't say that he curled up in the fetal position. It says he walked through it. Why? Because he knows a God that's going to prepare a table for him in the midst of his enemies. 
He knows a God who's a shepherd to him. You have to hear the ownership in how David starts the psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. He could care less if he's yours or mine. The Lord is David's shepherd. I shall not want, because he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters, right? Your rod and your staff, your comfort me. In fact, as he's walking through the valley of the shadow of death, that's what his eyes are on. What your eyes are on as you walk through life is everything. Guys, I've been consumed by stress and anxiety, if I'm honest. I can still preach a good game. I was down in Delaware. God's moving. David Twalifies here, my good friend who had Adam and I come down to Presbyterian Church. I can be in Norway and kick up a good game. But at the end of the day, when I'm alone, there's stuff that wants to try to eat my lunch, and I have not been dealing with it well. And and you know what? It's getting worse. And I'm not looking for you to come up and wrap your arm around me. I don't care. Like, I've got to get to a meeting afterwards anyway. What I'm saying is, it doesn't matter at the end of the day. It doesn't matter. Because of who walks with me through the valley. Because of who's there. Do you want to know the number one reason why the the Israelites never got out of where they were in that wilderness journey? They grumbled and complained. Guys, I've heard it said and it's just true. Grumbling and complaining is the worship music of hell. It's self-centered. And I don't want to look at life as an opportunity to whine. I want to see it as an opportunity to shine. Is it okay if I go a little bit longer? Okay. I'm going to bring it. Whoever said that? I think it was Dutch. I can't. Yeah, it's Dutch. Let me say this. In Matthew 26, you don't have to go there. And Jen, if you want to bring it up, you can. I think it might be around verse 38. I don't know. Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. Do you know that he was a man? Are we clear on this? He's even raised from the dead as a man. He's sitting right now as a man. He's sitting in heaven on the mercy seat. His blood is speaking on behalf of you and I. He's raised from the dead. He's not a ghost. He says, touch here, touch here. He's flesh and blood raised from the dead. He's a man representing mankind forever. That's who he is. He emptied himself, took on the form of a man, and felt everything you and I have ever felt. Felt it. Tempted in every way without sin. He's in the garden, the darkest time of his life. He knows the agony his flesh is about to go through. And not only that, he knows he's about to face the weight of the world's sin come upon him. He knows that the holy eyes of God can't look upon it. He knows he's going to be crying out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He knows what he's about to go through. And he doesn't try to get out of it. He doesn't avoid it. He prays through it. His closest friends are sleeping when it matters most. And sometimes you're going to have people, they're completely oblivious to what you're going through. And over and over and over again, Jesus knew the art of strengthening himself in his Father. Even he would turn to the Father and pray. He would go off by himself and pray. That's the answer. I'm not a nurse. I'm not medically trained. But I know this, under great duress, I know this, that the, that the, the blood vessels around your, your, the, your sweat glands can actually burst, mix, mix blood in with your sweat. And it actually says in Luke's gospel that he sweat as though drops of blood. Agony. He walked through that. He didn't try to get out of it. Because of the joy set before him. And love doesn't fail. We have to stop. Guys, can I tell you something? Most of what scares you is what God is calling you in life to be a voice to and overcome. It's what he's calling you to. And, and I, most of the time, I rise to the challenge, and there are times where, where it takes me a little bit longer to get there. But I'm, I can't afford to let fear stop my destiny. Fear will stop your destiny. I'll end with this, and then I want to read something to you. Is this okay, Adam? Are you, is it okay? I'm still going? All right, thank you. <laughs> I like mystery. 
I'll say this. If you guys get a chance, go read about Mary and Martha in Luke chapter 10. And understand that it was Martha who was worried and bothered by all of her preparations. But it was Mary who chose the better part. And it says, and it won't be taken away from her. You know what won't be taken away from her? Stress and anxiety can never touch what you build with God. It won't be taken away. She's seated at, at his feet, seated at his feet, listening to his every word. I'll end with this. And I, I really don't mean this to offend. I really don't. I love Tom Petty. <laughs> Thank you, Craiger. I love the guy. Lo- I grew up with him. I've seen him in concert. It, my, my mom was a hippie. So, like, I, I've grown up with, with what I call great music. The music of today, I'm sorry, newsflash, it's not music. Like, doesn't take much. Like, Tom Petty wrote a song back in the 1980s on his album Full Moon Fever called I Won't Back Down. Somehow Tom Petty gets it and the church doesn't. I love Tom Petty because his story is an underdog story. If you ever have a chance to, to learn about the guy, he's actually got a documentary right now on Netflix. It's four hours long. I gobbled it up. Uh, wouldn't it good? Craiger, you and I are so much alike, dude. Motorcycles, Tom Petty. It's amazing. Jesus. Tom Petty writes, I won't back down. No, I won't back down. You can stand me up at the gates of hell but I won't back down. Gonna stand my ground, won't be turned around, and I'll keep this world from dragging me down. Gonna stand my ground, and I won't back down. Hey, baby, there ain't no easy way out. Hey, I will stand my ground, and I won't back down. Well, I know what's right. I got just one life. In a world that keeps on pushing me around, but I'll stand my ground and I won't back down. Tom Petty gets it. I felt like the Lord said this to me last week, two things. As long as you and I don't forfeit our faith, we're overcoming. If all you and I are able to do is stand, we're overcoming. Ephesians 6 says, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. It's late. There's other things I wanted to do. I've got to honor the time. I want you to stand up with me. Let me just say this. Not everybody. If you know with what I'm saying, hang on, don't get up yet. Hang on, Rachel Lindsay. You watch yourself. I love you, Rachel. Rachel. If you know, and what I'm saying to you, and you're saying this to yourself, I've been dealing with stress in unhealthy ways. I haven't been dealing with it with the Lord. I've been taking it here, there, and elsewhere. I want you to stand up, and I don't want you to be afraid. If you have not been dealing with your stress and anxiety in the way that you know you should be, I want you to stand. You've been avoiding. You've been running. You've been avoiding people. You've been avoiding the source. You've been avoiding pain. You've been avoiding relationships. You've just been on the run. I want to bless you. Father, I ask right now that the peace that you've given to me this past week by just being awakened to the fact that we have not, that I have not been dealing with it well, I ask that the repentance that's taking place in the room right now would bring peace alongside of it. Father, here's our opportunity to say to you in our own way, Lord, I have not been dealing with it in the way you've asked me to. I've been running here and everywhere and not to the one where comfort comes from. And I'm asking God that right now we would cast on you what concerns us and receive now, in Jesus' name, the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. And Father, I pray that you'd look upon us and forgive what we've been caught up in. Forgive that we've been turning to things not out of faith, but out of old ways of thinking and old ways of coping. And I ask that those things would perish right now at the revelation of what's been shared and that we would understand the art of strengthening ourselves in the Lord. I ask God that as we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we would fear no evil because your rod and your staff, the things that we choose to look at, they bring us peace and comfort. So Father, I just ask for a release of grace right now 
in Jesus' name to rest upon the ones that are saying, I'm done with this. I don't want to turn to this anymore. And I ask that freedom would ring out right now in this place as we say, no more. I'm denying this and saying yes to you. So God, I pray that you would teach us to embrace you wholeheartedly and build with you what Mary built in Luke chapter 10 so that anxiety and stress can never take it. Forgive us, God, for turning to everything and everyone and everywhere else but you. Let your peace now, God, come upon these ones. And I pray that you would teach us to live in the moment. Be aware that there's birds singing. Life is happening all around us. And we don't want to miss a moment. Father, forgive us for saying, I can't wait. I'm guilty of this. Till the kids go to bed so I can just breathe. God, don't even let us miss a moment with our children. Make us to live out with you what Jesus paid the price for. In Jesus' name. Amen. I bless you guys. If you're in the leaders meeting, we're back here in the youth room. Otherwise, I'll see you guys next Sunday. Thank you so much.